Well, good evening. It's good to be with you once again today. We hope you've had a good day today as we once again come back to assemble and spend some time in God's Word. We're going to be in the book of Daniel here in just a moment. Ready to get your Bibles? We'll start in chapter 1, but we're going to visit that famous story in Daniel chapter 3. And so we encourage you to be finding your Bible or your phones or your scrolls or whatever you use to get over there and We'll be there in just a moment. You know, I've got a large collection of books. And one of my favorite is just this little book called Kids' Instructions on Life. And so just a sampling from that, Patrick, age 10, says, Never trust a dog to watch your lunch. Rosemary, age 7, said, Never try to hide a piece of broccoli in a glass of milk. Kelly, age 10, says, never, ever be too full for dessert. Now, I've lived by that one. Heather, age 16, says, when your dad is mad and asks, do I look stupid, don't answer him. Philip, age 13, says, never dare your little brother to paint the family car. And Molly, age 11, says, remember, you're never too old to hold your father's hand. And that's true spiritually. And that's why we're here. The hand of God that leads us, that guides us, that helps us, that does so much for us. That's why we're here. Tonight we want to talk about the idea of the difference that you make. The story is told of a group of teenagers that were in a Friday night pizza place. And as teenagers do, they were kind of rowdy and they were kind of tossing food and making noise and big commotion and getting things a little bit out of hand. And pretty soon another teenager joined them. And the whole atmosphere changed. They got real quiet, and they picked up all the food that they had been thrown at each other, and they put away all their trash. And as they were leaving, an older couple who was watching all this grabbed a hand of one of the teenage girls and said, we were so bothered by you, we were about ready to tell the manager about you, but you changed. And the teenage girl said, well, when our friend came in, he's a Christian. It's easy to be good around a Christian. And when we think about this idea, we want to talk about the difference that you and I make. The Bible tells us that we are to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And, and when we consider that concept, we often get discouraged because we wonder, am I really making a difference? I know parents feel this way. You, you, you try to have a structured life for your children, have bedtime, had curfews, watch who their friends are, talk about the concept of making good friends. You, you want them to understand authority. You question their judgment, but they always want to argue with you. They always want to go the other direction. And you look at the world today, and there's so many broken homes and so many dysfunctional homes, and you think, our kids have such an advantage. They have such a blessing. Do they even realize what they have? And you scratch your head and you wonder, are we even making a difference? And I know Bible class teachers feel this way. I hear this sometimes from them. You stay up late at night just kind of getting all your lessons done. You find neat things you hope the kids will remember. And you're in their Sunday morning teaching and they're looking at you kind of starry-eyed and they're just kind of oh, just not with you very well. And then a hand goes up and you get so excited and you call on that child, yes. Child says, can I go to the bathroom? And you think, am I making a difference? And I know we preachers feel this way. We pour our hearts into sermons, and we preach and preach and preach and preach what we think the congregation needs, and sometimes we see no change, no movement, and we begin to wonder, am I making a difference? And I know shepherds feel this way. They bring in guest speakers, they, they design classes for the congregation, they do all this work thinking, hopefully thinking that something good's going to happen, and you wonder, are we getting in closer to Jesus? Are we getting in stronger spiritually? Are we making a difference? And, and those that try to teach others often feel this way. You invite your co-workers to come, and they never come. You invite family members to sit down for a Bible study, and they never want to have that Bible study. You try, you try, you try, and you begin to wonder, am I even making a difference? And even congregationally, you wonder about that. Here we are in this place, 
And does the community know we're here? Does the community have any impact how this congregation is different than the other churches and the other denominations out there? How are we so different? Do they understand that? And sometimes we wonder, are we making a difference? Now, Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, considered one fate between man and beast. And once, what Solomon said here is, for the fate of the sons of men and the fate of the beast is the same. As one dies, so does the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath, and there's no advantage for the man over the beast for all his vanity. In Solomon's perspective, you're no different than the cow. And a cow eats and a cow dies. You eat and you die, and there simply is no difference. Solomon would go on to say, as he talked about the different classes of people, it's all the same, he says. It's one fate for the righteous as for the wicked, for the good and for the clean, for the unclean, for the man who offers a sacrifice and the one who does not offer a sacrifice. As for the good man, so is the sinner, as the swearer, so the one who does, who's afraid to swear. And his point is, we all die, and what difference are we even making? And you might say, well, Brother Shouse, this is just sounds like a wonderful sermon today. This is just so pessimistic. But what Solomon failed to consider is that, first of all, you and I are created in the image of God. We have people in our lives that make a difference, whether it's school teachers or coaches or parents or grandparents, shepherds and preachers and mentors, and, and we are made in the image of God. And the spiritual difference is all the difference. It makes all the difference together. And so what we're going to look at this evening is three simple points from Daniel chapter 3 about how you need to remind yourselves you do make a difference. But let's first of all, before we get to Daniel 3, go over to Daniel chapter 1. Most of us in this assembly this evening understand the story. We remember that by God's province and God's declaration that Judah was coming to an end, and for 70 years they'd go away into Babylonian captivity. That begins in chapter 1. And we see in verse 4, it says that the king, uh, from verse 3, ordered that the youths in whom there was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence and every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court, and he ordered them to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. What we see here is a three-step approach to change them. First of all, we're going to rename you. Secondly, we're going to tame you. And thirdly, we're going to claim you. And so when we go over here and look in verse 7, and we see how the Jewish names were changed, we know them by the Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you understand what those names really mean? If not, let's take the name Roger, and how do you pronounce that in French? Or let's take the name Roger, and how would you say that in Russian? That's not what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are. First of all, Shadrach is the name of a Babylonian god. So every time he was called, it was a slap in their face because I'm calling you not by God's name, but by a Babylonian name. Look, if you will, in verse 7, where it says their names here. There's Hananiah. See that I-A-H? It's a reference to God. Isaiah, I-A-H. Michelle, M-I-S-H-E-L. E-L means Elohim, God's name. Daniel, E-L, that's that connection there. And then Azariah, there's again another I-A-H. Those were the Hebrew names. All of them had connection to God. Shadrach was the name of a Babylonian god. Meshach meant your god despises you. Where was your god when Babylon came into Jerusalem? How strong is your God that we walk down the walls? How powerful is your God? We went into his temple and we raided it. And so every time his name was named, it was a mock of God. Then Abednego was another name for a Babylonian God. And so what we see here is how that culture, parallel to our culture today, is trying to rename us, tame us, and then claim us. Now we go to chapter 3. And we remember Daniel chapter 3 is where we read about the fiery furnace. We won't take the time to read all the passage. Most of us have read this time and time again. Just pulling out a few verses from this in verse 4, as it talks about 
this proclamation which the king Nebuchadnezzar had made. Then the herald loudly proclaimed to you the command is given to people, nations, men of every language. At the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the tigron, the psalter, the bagpipe, all kinds of music. You are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of, ba of blazing fire. There's not going to be a trial. You're not going to get a defense attorney. There's not going to be a time for appeal. You don't bow, you're going to fire right now. And that was the command. And that's what they faced. And that's what they had to endure as we think about that. Jumping ahead to verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Notice the, the pronouns you, you, you. Your God, your proclamation. Your command. These boys are treasonous is what they are saying. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Now notice again the change. That you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up. Now if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the tech, the tigron, the psalter, the bagpipe, all kinds of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship you will immediately be cast in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is that it can deliver you out of my hands? I am more powerful than your God. I've shown you that because we took your, your country. I am more powerful than any God. What God can conquer me? Notice the response. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, verse 16, said to the, replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning the matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire. He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. And even if he doesn't, he says, verse 18, O king, we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Such convictions, such understandings, such great faith. Now understand, they didn't have mom and dad behind them saying, the boys, remember what we talked about Bible class last week? Mom and dad were probably in Jerusalem dead. Probably. They were there by themselves. And they did this without any spiritual tools. They had no tools to help them. They didn't have a Bible to pull out. They didn't have the phone to flip over. Let, let me check my Bible out real fast. Let me, get the, let me call a preacher. They were on their own about this. Not only this, three sentences is all they say. We are not going to serve your God, and even if our God does not deliver us, we are not going to do this. And what we notice is the power of God that changed them. We see, once again, at the end of this chapter, after they come out of that blazing fire, not even smelling like smoke, the king would say in verse 28, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who set his angel and delivered his servants, who put the trust in him, violating the king's command and yielding up the bodies so that they would not worship any god except their own god. And what we see here is that they were confident in their faith. They were unashamed to be different or to be recognized, and they did not let the consequences, even death itself, change them. It's powerful. A reading while ago takes us to the book of Acts in chapter 16, where we find Paul and Silas in prison. And at midnight, the doors are open. The jailers do not run. I mean, that's dream come true. It's dark. It's past midnight. The doors are open. The chains fall off. That's what every prisoner has dreamed about. But they stayed. They didn't stay because there was a guard with a sword. They stayed because of the difference that Paul and Silas were making. They had been beaten. They were bleeding. And it's late. And what are they doing? They're not singing, we get a phone call. We get a phone call. Get my lawyer. They're not singing jailhouse rock. They're praising God. Now, what if there's a stop for us? A lot of us would say, I have no reason to praise God. 
because I'm hurting, I'm bleeding. It seems like God has left me here. But those two praised, and they made a difference. And the people noticed. And so I want to share just three simple thoughts from these thoughts today. Number one, people are going to notice. They, are, they will notice sometimes without you even notice they're noticing. And some people watch because they're curious. They are watching because they have never seen things like that. They've never seen what you're doing. Others watch because deep down inside they want to be like you. They wish they had a conviction like you do. They wish they had a backbone like you do. They wish they were fearless like you are. And then some people are watching because they're critical. They're just waiting for you to mess up. They're watching for you to make a wrong statement, a wrong step, and then they'll try to get you. But what you know is what, what some people notice is they notice a hope in you. First Peter 3, verse 15, we so often misuse this passage. The passage reads, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. First and foremost, Jesus has to be number one in my life. That's the emphasis there. I have sanctified, set apart Jesus as the Lord in my heart. Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give account for the hope that's in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Through the years, I think we've gotten this passage backwards. I think we get the idea that I need to be able to answer every single question somebody asks me. I'm at work and say, hey, I have a question for you. It's like, stomp the person. You know, I'm asked some questions, and I don't even understand the question. I can't answer because I don't even know what you're talking about. He doesn't say that. They're not answering every single question someone asks you. What they're seeing is, you got hope. This world is nuts. But you're not running to a pilot bottle of pills to get through it. This world is crazy. But you don't drink yourself to sleep every night. This world is crazy. But you're not an extremist. This world is crazy, but you got hope. And the hope is not in the next election. The hope is not in the White House. The hope is not in the Supreme Court. Your hope is in Jesus Christ. They notice that about you. There's a sense of calm about you when everyone else seems to be going just crazy. They notice that you grieve differently. Paul would say in the Thessalonian letter, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. When a Christian dies, it is sad. We do grieve. You know, we, we oftentimes talk about the celebration at the funeral and someone's going on. I, I told my family, if you don't cry at my funeral, I'm coming back and I'm going to scare you to death at night. You know? There is a grief, but there's a grief with hope. A hope that we know that they're in a better world than we are. A hope that we know that they're with Jesus Christ. A hope that we want to be with them someday. And they notice that. I did a funeral just Friday, and the lady wasn't a Christian. Her husband was a, was a decorated military officer, just amazing the medals that was on his uniform in that casket. But he, too, wasn't a Christian. And as the family left, and just me and the widow was there, she was shaking the body, saying, wake up, wake up. And I looked over and said, Rose, he's not there. He's not there. You see, we, t we tear, we feel sad, but it's not hopelessness. It's not despair. It's not the world is over because we have something in Jesus Christ. People are going to know us when you go to work tomorrow that you have a different work ethic than everyone else. Paul would use this in re reference to slaves. Slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fear in the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. It's not the company. It's not the paycheck. It's Jesus Christ who I'm working for. And I give my heart. If I made a promise I work eight hours, I'm going to work eight hours. I'm not going to say, Hey, the boss is gone. I'm on Amazon. Boss is gone. Now let's get out the games. Let's play some games. And people notice that. The number one reason why people switch jobs today is not for higher money. The number one reason is because of toxic work environments. And people notice you're different. You don't gossip like everyone else. You're not talking bad about everyone else. You're not trashing the boss like everyone else. You're not, you're not just negative like everyone else. They will notice. And sometimes when you think, am I making a difference? Yeah, they notice that. 
And they're going to come and ask you the question. They're going to notice that you go to church, and i got a Bible question, and I want to ask you. I'm not going to ask this co-worker because he's nuts. I'm not going to ask this guy because he's all over the map. But you, you're the one that we're going to talk about. They notice a difference in your marriage. Let's grab the verses here, First Peter chapter 3, where, again, Peter talks about the relationship among Christians and the confines of marriage. And he's saying First Peter chapter 3 in the first four verses, in the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, that they may be won without a word by the behavior of the wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. And let, let not the adornment be external only, the braid of the hair, the wearing of gold jewelry, and putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart, in perishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. How we refer to our husbands and wives when we're away from them is a reflection. And people notice that. And people see these things. And people understand that concept within you. And then some people will notice a willingness to help. Galatians 6 verse 10, So then while we have opportunity, let's do good to all people, especially not only to the household of God, but especially to the household of God. We're helping all people anywhere that we can. Again, the great emphasis we should have. And then a consistency in your behavior. Titus would say they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him. Their talk and their walk doesn't match. And in Timothy, as we think about the, the role of the shepherds and the elders, it says he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he may not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Blameless. This doesn't apply just to those who are shepherds. It applies to every single Christian. What do people say about my faith? Do they say, oh, wow, I didn't know he was a Christian. I'm kind of surprised at that. Or would they say, obviously he's a Christian. I could see that through and through. Without saying a word by his behavior, by his attitude, by his conduct, I see these things. And because of these things, they will ask you questions. Because of these things, they will respect and trust you. Because of these things, they will remember your examples. Long after you are gone, they'll still talk about that. They'll still talk about the example you set. They'll talk about your pattern. They'll talk about your attitude. Remember in Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son. And in verse 17, it says, When he came to his senses, he said, How may my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger? He remembered. Dad took care of those slaves. Those slaves didn't get just a pinch of food. They ate well because of dad. He noticed those things. And that's why I want you to realize, everywhere you go, people noticed. I've talked to several people who work in the restaurant industry. We have some people in our congregation who own some restaurants. And they often say the Sunday after church crowd is the worst crowd because they're bossy, they're demanding, and they're chintzy when it comes to tips. May that never be said of us. We are making a difference. And our lights don't just shine in this room. They shine in every room that God has us in. Second thing, as we think about this, just simple little lesson, just remind us of, and that is little things matter in a big way. In the book of Matthew, Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, in this regard, he says, and whoever the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Now notice the two, the two extremes there. One is a little one. We're not talking about the most important. We're not giving it to the apostles. We're not giving it to the, the Jesus himself. But one of these little disciples of mine, and what does he give? Not a case of water. I didn't pay your water bill for the month. I didn't get you a gallon of water. I got you one cup of cold water. How much does that cost? And what Jesus says is heaven noticed. Heaven notices the little things. And the reason why heaven notices that is because the little things matter because they're so rare today. And heaven notices because it shows that you are thinking of them. And heaven notices because that they matter because it illustrates that you care. Well, in the book of 1 Corinthians, if you turn there with me, chapter 12, as the apostle here is trying to teach the Corinthian church about spiritual gifts. 
and why there's a variety of gifts, he gives us this little lesson about body parts. And there's lots of little lessons we learn from this. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and begins verse 14, the apostle would say it this way. He says, For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, is it not for this reason any less a part of the body? And if the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, am I not a part of the body? For, is it for this reason any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he has desired. You ever notice this list he gives? They're all essential body parts. To lose any of them would be considered handicapped. He didn't say some of us are hair. Some of us don't have hair. And we're getting along pretty good, aren't we? You can live without hair. Some, he didn't say some of us are earlobes. You know, some of us have the danglies and some of us just have a hook to our head. I don't understand why, but that's just how it is. He didn't say some of us are little toenails. I'm sure there's a part of for little toenails, but you know, you can get along pretty good without toenails. But at this evening, if the Lord came down here and said, read this passage, and when you leave this building, you have to leave one of these body parts here, which would you leave? His feet? Kind of tough getting home, would it? My hands? That's going to be tough. My eyes, my ears, see, all of these are essential. And all of these do different things. One of the lessons I had to learn very hard as a young preacher was I, I had the concept early in preaching, kind of like the, the cookie cutter. You know, you, you see uh, these big cookie cutter companies, and here comes this big thing of dough down the conveyor belt, and here comes this big stamp and stamps every single cookie, those Keebler cookies. They all look exactly the same. And that's how I believe we were. Every one of us ought to be able to teach a Bible class. Every one of us ought to be able to go personal evangelism. Every one of us ought to do this. Everyone, no, we can't do that. Say, let's all lead singing. Count me out. I was in the wrong line for that gift. You see, we all can't do the same thing. And that's the point of this passage. Foot doesn't have to become a hand. Eye doesn't have to become an ear. But we need them all. And what happens sometimes in the congregation is the public folks, the song leaders, the preachers, the shepherds, the Bible class teachers, they get the attention because they're public. But every single person is essential. The person that sends that card that says, I saw you here today, haven't seen you in a while, you made my day. That's important. The person that takes food to someone who's sick and shut in, that's important. If all you can do in life is point your finger, then point it down at your phone and send somebody a text. Thinking about you today. Put your name on it. If all you can do is stick your tongue out at life, put a stamp on it and mail card. But what we see is that the little bitty things matter. They all matter. Here in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 14, Jesus is in the midst of heading toward the cross. He's in a home. And a woman comes and anoints him. Very expensive oil that she anoints him with. In fact, the apostles get on her for wasting that kind of oil. She had been sent, spent, and given to the poor people. Jesus responds, she has done what she could. She's anointed my body beforehand, before burial. Notice the expression, she has done what she could. She didn't do everything. She didn't go to the cross because she can't do that. She didn't write the Bible. There's no books of the Bible written by her. No, she couldn't do that. She wasn't one of the apostles. No, but she did what she could do. And can you say that about yourself? Now, I may not be able to lead singing. Maybe I can't preach. And maybe my gift is not teaching. Maybe my gift is not public. But here's what I can do. And I'm going to do what I can do. That's so essential as we think about that. And then finally, our third point, often the good that you do is so hard to be measured by others. And it's hard to measure the good. It's hard to measure the value of spiritual friends. Been there together. I wrote a blog about this the other day. You know, I, um, my genre of music is British 60s music. That's the kind of stuff I like. But I got one song that's stuck in there that doesn't fit any of that, and that's a Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton song, of all people, because I don't like either one of them very well. 
But they've got this song that the words just tug my heart, and is you cannot make old friends. And the first time I heard that, I said, that's the dumbest thing I heard. Yes, you can. And then I thought about that. You can make new friends. You can meet somebody. But you can't make an old friend. It takes time. And a lot of you in this building have been old friends for a long, long time. You've been to weddings together. You've been to funerals together. You've had tears together. You've had smiles together. You've been through church issues together over and over. And that's our idea here. And so when you think about it, it's hard to measure friendships, the good that you do. Secondly, it's hard to measure the internal growth. You know, when, you, when you're a child, you went to grandma's house, you stood by this one door cage, and they put a little mark how tall you were. You came back, and you're a little bit taller, and you're a little bit taller, and you can see that growth externally, but it's hard to see that growth internally. It's hard to see someone getting stronger and stronger in Jesus, but it takes place. And it's hard to measure a change in thinking. Change, that some, as we talked about in our lesson this morning, less rope and maybe more rags, maybe less harshness and more compassion, understanding what other people are going through and thinking about other people, and then it's hard to measure when we are gone because someday that's going to happen. Let's turn our Bibles over to the book of Romans, chapter 12. I'll wrap it up here, and then I've got just a couple of illustrations I want to give with you. Romans, chapter 12. Begin with verse 9. Here, as the Apostle Paul turns this book and starts talking about practical applications, he says in verse 9, Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cleave to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and curse not, he says. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in your mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. What he's talking about here is investing in each other. Investing in each other. You do that by being there for each other. You do that by listening. You do that by offering a hand and giving yourself. You do that by showing Jesus Christ. Now, if I was to go, this is not the right season, but if we were to go over to an apple orchard and pick off an apple, we could, we could count how many apples are in that tree. And we could cut open an apple, dig out the seeds, count how many seeds are in that apple. But if we were to plant those seeds, and those seeds grow and become apple trees, how many apples are in those seeds? And that's the good that you do. There's a story told of this little bitty town and they had, the oldest resident was 103 years old, and she died. And being the oldest person in town, the editor of the little paper said, we need to write something about her. I mean, this, this is kind of an honorable thing. She lived that long. And so the guy who wrote obituaries for the paper did some digging, couldn't find a thing. She didn't belong to any church. She never volunteered. She never was in school system. She never did anything. So then he looked on the dark side. She was never arrested. She never was in jail. There was no court holdings about her. And he went back to the editor and said, I can't write a thing because I can find nothing about her. And the editor says, we've got to write something. So, he's, so he was thinking about this and thinking about this. Went to lunch. He says, you know, the next guy that walks through the door, I'm going to give him that assignment. In walked the sports editor. He says, I got a job for you. You're going to write this lady's obituary. And so the sports editor did the same thing. And he said, Sister Mabel, our oldest resident, 105 years old. No strikes, no fouls, no runs. Basically, sometimes that's our life. Sometimes we define our faith by what we don't do. What is a Christian? Well, a Christian doesn't drink. A Christian doesn't cuss. A Christian doesn't do this, and a Christian doesn't... Well, what does a Christian do? No hits, no runs, no outs. And so what we need to see from this is that you make a difference, every one of you. Here it's a Sunday evening. It's a beautiful day. You could have said, you know what? Done church this morning. Don't need to come back tonight. I'm out of here. 
but you're here. And people notice. Look who's here tonight. And maybe you don't come often on Sunday night, but here you are. And maybe you're a regular on Sunday night, and here you are, and they expect that. Maybe you came in and you had a smile on your face and someone else was kind of grumpy today. And you changed their expression. You've changed their heart. You see, you make a difference. And that's what I want you to see. You don't ever have to stand behind the pulpit to make a difference. You don't ever have to be someone who preaches to make a difference. But by your heart, your attitude, your involvement, your connections, you can make a world of difference in this church. I need to be here because these people need me. Now, I need to tell you about Jimmy. Jeff kind of wanted me to tell you this story. I'm going to try not to cry. There are four names in the story. Okay? First name is a guy named James. He goes by the name of Jimmy. He spells it J-I-M-I. He's from Connecticut. He moved to Alabama. He's a con contractor. He started working at contracting work. Started dating this lady. One night, according to his own words, he spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars smoking crack cocaine. He drank a case of beer. He doesn't remember how many pain kills he took. That alone would have killed me. He went back to the house where the girl he was dating, his mother was. That's whose house he's working on. With a hammer, he hammered her to death. He was arrested. He's in Alabama prison. In the course of time, the prison TV didn't work. And Jimmy admits that this isn't good, but he was bored because he had nothing to do. So he picked up the Bible and read it cover to cover. He picked it up a second time and read it cover to cover with no preacher, with no tracks, no outside influence, no Bible classes. He asked the warden, I have to be immersed for the remission of my sins according to the book of Acts. And Jimmy was baptized. Jimmy is a New Testament Christian. He will never worship in the church like you have. He's never sung with the other saints. He's never taken the Lord's Supper because he's in prison. Now, the second person in the story, her name is Sarah. She's the granddaughter of the woman who was killed. Sarah's life fell apart because grandma was the, was the patriarch or the matriarch of the family and her life was spinning backwards through drugs one day she's driving down the road and she hears this pop song write the letter so she decided to write jimmy a letter and jimmy got the letter he was afraid to open it he's afraid that the letter is going to say you you deserve what you're going to get may you rot where you are but instead the letter said something different the letter said i'm tired jimmy I'm tired of hating you. I'm tired of thinking about this crime. I'm tired of all this. Jimmy, I forgive you. Jimmy wrote Sarah back. Sarah wrote Jimmy back. And they've had phone calls. The third name in this is a man by the name of Van Cooper. Van Cooper is an elder at a little bitty church called Bear Creek in Alabama. And Van does some Bible studies in prisons. Van got a hold of Jimmy. They've had some Bible studies. Van is one of my regular readers of Jump Starts. He shared some of my Jump Starts with Jimmy. And when I heard the story, I wrote about that. Now, Jimmy's story and the story of forgiveness got caught by the national press. The Atlantic Monthly in May wrote an article about this. It's called The Murder Forgiven. And so... After I wrote about this, it kind of went everywhere. And the night I wrote it, I got an email from Sarah, the granddaughter. She said, I'm so thankful that this word is getting out. The story of Jimmy is touching a lot of lives. I wrote her back and said, how did you hear about me? How did you hear about the blog? She said, Jimmy told me to contact you. 11 days from today, Jimmy's going to die. He's on death row in the Alabama prison. Jimmy's not afraid. He and I have written multiple times together. Jimmy says, I've done a lot of wrong, but there's one thing they can't do. They can't take heaven away from me. Now, there's two powerful things coming out of that story. 
Number one, you can be a Christian with just this. You don't need a mountain of other things to convince you. Jimmy had this and nothing else. And the word still works. Paul is saying in Romans chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God. Behind prison bars, this man's heart was touched simply by the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. Jimmy is a Christian. He wrote me a letter that he wanted me to read last Sunday back home. His letter was thanking our people for reaching out to him and encouraging him and thankful that his story is touching lives. And then at the end of his letter, he says, I look forward to standing before you and thanking you each personally. Now, he's not talking about getting out and coming down Charlestown Road. He's not getting out. He's talking about when we see each other in heaven. The second thing that this powerful lesson teaches us is grace and forgiveness. Imagine to have the heart of that granddaughter that says, I'm going to let it go. How many of us are holding on to things that we just need to let go? How many of us are held back because somebody a long time ago said something? Somebody didn't invite me. Somebody looked cross-eyed at me, and I will never, ever talk to them again. Here's somebody who the dearest person in her life was killed. And she wrote Jimmy and said, I forgive you. And then the most powerful lesson of all is the grace of God. The grace of God touches us. I keep thinking about July 20th, because that's when Jimmy's going to die. I wrote Jimmy last week. July 21st, I'm speaking at a youth group in Dallas, Texas. Me and my son are speaking to a bunch of young people. And when I wrote Jimmy, I said, Jimmy, on July 21st, when I speak, you will be on the other side by one day. I'm going to tell your story. Will you write me something that I can read to these young people? I want to touch their hearts through you. And so that's what I want to leave with you tonight. All of us, in a lot of ways, were in Jimmy's shoes. By our sins, we were condemned to die. But by the blessing of Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness. And I don't want you to take advantage, I don't want you to take for granted something like a Sunday night worship service. It's a Sunday night, here we are, another sermon, yada, yada. Jimmy doesn't get to enjoy what you enjoy right now. Jimmy doesn't get to see. Can you imagine the first time Jimmy gets to sing with somebody? It will be with the saints in heaven. Jimmy will never take in the Lord's Supper. Jimmy will never have heard a sermon preached. But by the grace of God, his sins are forgiven. And by the grace of God, your sins are forgiven. And so this evening, if you're not a Christian, you need to see that applies to you. What must I do? Just read this book. Do what this book says. It will touch your heart. And then realize Here's somebody who did a, a horrendous crime, and he makes no apologies about that. He knows what he did is wrong, and he's ashamed of that. But by his example and the grace of God, he is making a difference today. There's a lot of people all over this world. Even this morning, I got a text from a lady one of my readers, 11 days, I'm praying every day for Jimmy. Jimmy's not asking to get out. Jimmy's not asking anybody to write the governor. He's wanting to go to heaven. How about you? You're subject anyway, once you come, stands up.